when we are driving a car, we're moving at constant velocity. But then when we apply the brakes, a force arises very much like friction that opposes the motion. What this force will do to that constant velocity is try to reduce it and a deceleration will occur. Now that deceleration will be dependent on a number of different factors, including how fast I'm going and of course how hard I try to brake. So in this video, let's look at the factors that affect the braking distance of a car. When we're trying to stop because something has come into our field of view, there is a slight delay between seeing the obstruction and applying the brakes. And this comes about because of our reaction time. Because it takes me a certain number of seconds to register the danger, because of my motion, I've actually covered a small distance. Now that is called my thinking distance. It is how far I have gone whilst reacting to the danger. It starts when I first see the danger and it ends the moment I apply the brakes. The thinking distance, the how far you travelled between seeing the danger and applying the brakes depends upon a number of things. Most obviously, it depends on your reaction time. Now, it is possible to work out your reaction times using just a ruler and an equation. Galileo realised that the displacement that a thing could move was connected to how long it was moving for uh, within Earth's gravity. So if I drop a ruler vertically, the displacement it travels is equal to, assuming that it has started from um, uh, from rest, from not moving, a half times gravity, which is 10, times the time squared. So what I could do is I could test my reaction times by dropping the ruler between my fingers and where I catch it, imagining that I caught it at 60 centimetres, then I could do the following bit of maths. If this was 0.6 metres and this was equal to a half times 10 times t squared, and what I would need to do is divide both sides by a half times 10, which is 5. So divide both sides by 5, and that would get rid of those things on that side. So 0 0.6 divided by 5 is equal to t squared. Finally, if I square root both sides, I would find out what my reaction time is going to be. 0 0.6 divided by 5 or square rooted. And I've got here a calculator. I'm not going to do this in my head. 0.6 divided by 5. Square root that. And it works out that I caught it in 0.34 seconds. Now, if my reaction times were slower and I was travelling at a constant velocity, then what's going to happen is that I'm going to cover a greater distance with my longer reaction times than I would if my reaction times were shorter. If I was very responsive to danger, I would have a very short thinking distance because my reaction time was small. And so what we can see is that my reaction time affects my thinking distance. Now, what might affect my reaction time? Well, things like alcohol, drugs, uh, distractions, and other things of that nature that affect the driver's ability to concentrate on and recognise danger when they see it. Now, of course, the faster you are going, the more distance you will cover whilst reacting. If your reaction time is the same, but your speed is larger, then what's going to happen is the distance you travel during that reaction time is going to be larger. It means that if you double your velocity, you're going to double your uh, 
thinking distance because you'll be going twice as fast so in that same time interval that is your reaction time you will have covered twice the distance. Now from the moment you apply the brakes what we then next need to think about is the distance the car covers whilst the brakes are applied. The braking distance and we need to look at the things that affect that as well. This apparatus here enables us to investigate the braking distance. The distance that the car travels from the application of the brake to the point where the car stops. And what it is, it's a dynamic trolley and it has this brake which drops down and rubs on the table. That's what brings this car to a stop. But what we need is for that brake to apply just at the right moment so that we can measure the braking distance. So what we do is we set this trolley to trigger and when I press trigger it's going to drive forward and when it gets to the end of this string this thing pulls out and the brake drops down and this enables the brake to engage and for us to measure the braking distance. Now with this we can investigate different factors that affect the braking distance. The very first thing I want to investigate is the effect of the size of the braking force. Now in a car, the braking force is affected by how hard you press the brake pedal. It's also affected by things like the condition of the brakes and the amount of friction that the tyres can produce, the condition of the tyres. Here we can model it because as this thing drops down and rubs on the table, at the moment what we have here is two nuts and this is going to provide a moderate braking force. But then we'll repeat the experiment a second time and we'll put these other nuts that are here on the trolley onto this to create a greater braking force and to observe the effect of that. So let's do it now with two. And it's nearly gone off the table. But now if we repeat it, with the four. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring this out and I'm going to reset all of this apparatus. So first of all I put in the, 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 the trigger that pulls out and I'm going to now add more nuts onto this so that when it triggers there is a greater braking force. And so put it exactly how it was, everything exactly the same. Let's give it a go. Three, two, one. There we have it. It has now not gone nearly so far. A greater braking force has resulted in a shorter braking distance. Another variable that will affect the braking distance is the road surface. If the road surface is wet or icy, then we predict that there would be a greater braking distance. Does this apparatus show that? So first of all, it is a dry road surface. We'll trigger it and we'll see exactly how far it goes. About here, about at the end of the ruler. So now we'll do it again and see what happens when we get this so the first thing we'll do is we'll reset the trolley so that the trolley is ready to go. Everything will be kept the same apart from the road surface. Let's put that in there. We'll put that in there. Now what we'll do is pour a whole load of water along the road surface here. It's a very wet day. Let's give it a good old, get a nice old white, get it all over the place. There we go. Now what happens, so here we have a really wet surface. It's been raining buckets and spades. What happens to our braking distance? It's not a lot, but it is definitely a little larger. On a wet day, you can consider that a wet road surface will add to your braking distance. On a frosty day, uh, trying to break over ice would significantly add 
to your braking distance. The condition of the brakes, the condition of the road surface, these things all affect the braking distance. But another thing that affects the braking distance is the velocity of the vehicle. So I've changed the apparatus now so that it can show us what happens when we go at larger speeds. And the way that I've done that is I've taken away the thing that the spring is pushing against and I'm now going to have the car pulled back on this large piece of elastic. The more I pull the car back, the faster it'll be travelling as it moves through this light gate. So the light gate's going to tell us what the velocity of the car is and what we can do is we can we can change that and then observe the effect that it has on the braking distance. So I'm going to press play here. I'm going to pull it back by a fixed amount. And this first one will just be a demonstration. So we'll go all the way back to here and we'll let it go through. And it stops in about 95 centimeters. The speed of the car, 0.78 meters per second. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to do this for a range of different velocities and record the braking distance each time and hopefully we will see that there is a pattern to these readings. And there she goes. And here is our data. You can see that we've plotted the independent variable, the thing that we were in control of, on the x-axis here. That's the velocity. And on the y-axis, we've plotted the dependent variable, the thing that we were measuring the change in when we changed the independent variable. That's the braking distance. And what you can see is that these are not linear they're not directly proportional. If anything, it looks like the braking distance is proportional to the velocity squared. Why would that be? Why would a slight increase in velocity result in a significant increase in braking distance? Well, there's some really good physics here. It's all to do with the energy being dissipated by the brake. If you remember, that energy being transferred is described by the physical quantity that we call work. And that you can calculate the amount of work done simply by multiplying the force that's being applied by the distance over which that force is applied. Now in this straight line, distance and displacement would be the same thing. And so for continuity, I'm going to call it displacement in this formula. But now we must consider the work itself, the energy being dissipated. Where does the energy go from the car? And where has it come from? Well, in this case, it is the kinetic energy that has been dissipated. It starts off with one value of kinetic energy, which is quite large because it's moving. And then as it stops, it goes down to a new value of kinetic energy, which is actually zero once it's stopped. But we could write that difference in kinetic energy with the familiar notation that u is the initial velocity and v is the final velocity. So we know that kinetic energy is a half mv squared, and we would write it like this. A half mv squared, that's the kinetic energy representing the final velocity, and that would be zero if it is braked, and that would be minus a half m u squared, which is the kinetic energy that represents the initial velocity. And all this does, by having one kinetic energy minusing the other one, is just looking at the difference, because that is what this braking force is going to do. It's going to change the velocity, and it's going to change the kinetic energy. Because that is the work done, that is equal to the force times the displacement. Now I want you to consider v squared and u squared. They are both multiplied by a half m. Or we could describe it as multiplied by m and divided by 2. Either way, 
we can see that that is a common factor. And so v squared minus u squared, all multiplied by m and divided by 2, is equal to force times displacement. So times everything by 2 gets rid of the 2 on this side. Is equal to 2 fs and now multiply everything sorry divide everything by m to get rid of this m and then we end up with v squared minus u squared equals 2 fs divided by m but i want you to remember that force is equal to mass times acceleration so the effect of dividing force by mass is that the what we would basically get is that v squared minus u squared is equal to 2 ma, which is what the force is equal to, times the displacement, all divided by m, which gives us v squared minus u squared is equal to 2as. This is the formula that helps us calculate how quickly something will be falling when it has fallen through a certain height in Earth's gravity. And what you can see is that this formula is also um, being a part of this situation. The, the reason why it appears in this graph that the braking distance is proportional to the velocity squared is because in this formula you can see that the braking distance s is indeed proportional to the velocity squared. So this graph is a brilliant proof of that formula that you need to know for GCSE. If we were to think about the total stopping distance, what we would need to do is we would need to add together the thinking distance and the braking distance. And so here we have three different situations represented. The first one is a car driving at 30 miles an hour, then 50 miles an hour, and then 70 miles an hour. And the, the first box represents how far that car has travelled whilst thinking. So this point here is the place in the road where the driver first notices a reason for braking, an animal running out in front of them or whatever. And this is the point where they then hit the brakes. All of the rest of the section after that is whilst the brakes are being applied to the point when the car actually stops. So the first box represents the thinking distance, the second box represents the braking distance. Here at 30 miles an hour, it takes 9 metres before the person engages the brakes and a further 14 metres after that to stop the car. So the total stopping distance is 23 metres. With 50 miles an hour, it is 15 metres are passed through before the brakes are applied and then a further 38 metres whilst the car is braking. So that's 10, 20, 30, 40, 53 metres in total. At 70 miles an hour, it is 21 metres of thinking distance and 75 metres of braking distance, which means we've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 91 metres of uh, of stopping distance. That is, unless I've miscounted somewhere, which is very, very possible. 96. Yeah, 96. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. 96. Got my maths in there. Right. Now, when we consider the, what, has, what does this actually show is it shows that um, the thinking distance is proportional to the speed of the car. That if the car doubles in its speed, the thinking distance will double because it will have travelled twice as far in that same reaction time as we spoke about before. But what it also shows is that the braking distance is getting 
uh, disproportionately larger because the braking distance is proportional to the velocity squared as we just explained and so that is why the braking distance is stretching further and further and further on. If we were to think about those things which affected the thinking distance is all of those things that affect your concentration. It could be distractions in the car, it could be alcohol, uh, children, loud music, anything you like. But if we were to consider what affects the braking distance, the condition of the tyres, or the brakes, the surface of the road. But more than anything, if you want to be able to stop uh, before you hit an object, it makes far more sense just to be driving more slowly.